Hello and welcome to Unworthy History. Today we got some actual history for you from this book right here, True Stories of the American Indians by Edward Sylvester Ellis. Now we're going to follow up on our last story that we did from this book about how John Smith was set to be put to death by Powhatan, but his daughter saved him, his daughter Pocahontas. So today we're going to pick up right after that. Powhatan seemed to think that since he had spared the life of the Englishman, John Smith, the latter should be turned to account. He made him help in forming bows and arrows, moccasins, robes, and copper trinkets. A son of the chieftain became friendly to Smith and did many kindnesses during his captivity. The Englishman rapidly learned the tongue of his captors, and this knowledge afterwards proved of great help to him. Finally, he was sent back to Jamestown. The guards who went with him were treated with great kindness, and a number of presents were sent through them back to Powhatan. This seems to have won the friendship of the old chief, who sent his daughter Pocahontas every few days to the settlement with food, where it was sorely needed. Everything would have gone well but for the foolish course of Captain Newport, who soon after arrived from a voyage to England. He gave Powhatan so many presents that the emperor was puffed up with his own importance and refused to part with any of his goods without being paid five or six times their value. When Newport had offered about all he had to offer, Powhatan sneeringly gave only two or three bushels of corn in return. Then it was that Smith proved himself as shrewd as the chieftain. He managed, as if by accident, to let Powhatan see a number of shining beads of blue glass. The chief's eye was caught, and he asked for them. Smith said that they were of great value and only worn by great kings. This fired the envy of the chief, who was determined to own them, for who had a better right than he to wear the jewels of a mighty monarch? With much seeming unwillingness, Smith parted with the beads for more than 200 bushels of corn. Powhatan began to fear that the continual coming of new emigrants meant danger to himself and his people. He began plotting to massacre the settlers, but the prompt vigor of Smith scared him, and he sent Pocahontas to Jamestown with a message that the evil plot was due to some of his fiery chiefs. Smith, who had taken several Indians prisoner, thereupon released them, and all remained tranquil for a time. Captain Newport's silly course with Powhatan came to a head in the autumn of 1608, when he arrived again from England just after Smith had been elected governor of the colony. Newport brought a gilded crown for Powhatan, and had the whole program arranged for his coronation. At the same time, settlers were offered to aid Powhatan against a tribe with which he was at war. When this message was sent to him, the haughty old leader told the English that since he was a king, he would not go to Jamestown, and as for the offered help, he did not wish it, as he knew how to manage his own affairs. Among the emigrants who came over with Newport were three Germans, who believed because of the woeful state of the colony that it could not last much longer. They gave their views to Powhatan and were base enough to offer to help him in putting all the English to death. The old chief fell in with the plan and agreed that the first step necessary was to remove Captain Smith. Powhatan tried many tricks to get him in his power, but that wise man outwitted him every time. The chief warned his warriors that if they failed to kill Smith, he would have them slain. About this time, a strange accident brought safety to the sturdy governor. One of Powhatan's men had by some means got hold of a quantity of gunpowder, which he told his friends he could handle as well as the whites themselves. Several gathered round to watch him when the stuff suddenly blew up and killed the Indian and two of his companions. Powhatan and the others were terrified and filled with a desire for peace. They brought back many stolen articles and in 1609 sent half their crop of corn to the settlers. About this time, Captain Smith was so shockingly burned by the burning of his powder bags that he went to England for surgical aid and never returned to Virginia. It should be added that of the three wicked Germans, one died miserably and the others were slain by order of Powhatan because of their deception. The colonists told the chief that John Smith was dead, but he would not believe it and some time later sent one of his chiefs, Tomokomo, to England to learn what had become of him. Tomokomo was also ordered to find out all he could about the country and to learn how many white people were there. 
The faithful servant began his duty by carrying a long stick into which he cut a notch every time he met a stranger. Needless to say that this means of taking the census proved a failure. When he came back to Virginia and Powhatan asked as to the population on the other side of the deep water, Tomokomo made his famous answer. Count the stars in the sky, the leaves on the trees, and the sand upon the seashore, for such is the number of people in England. Powhatan had many broils with the English, but it is only just to say that the fault lay more often with the latter than with him. The most shameful of all outrages was that of Captain Argall, who, while cruising up the James, invited Pocahontas to visit his ship under the escort of a squaw that had been bribed to betray her. Argall made Pocahontas a prisoner and took her to Jamestown. He believed Powhatan would hasten to ransom her for a large amount of corn which the settlement needed, but the enraged parent hastily prepared to go to war. During these evil days, John Rolfe and Pocahontas fell in love with each other and were married in the quaint old chapel at Jamestown in the month of April 1613. This pleasing event made Powhatan the friend of the white man, and as such he died five years later. We recall that Pocahontas and her husband visited England in 1616. She received much attention from the court and the leading people of the kingdom, but when about to sail for her native land, she fell ill and died. She left an infant son, Thomas, who was educated in London by his uncle, Henry Rolfe. He settled in Virginia after reaching manhood, became wealthy, and was one of the foremost members of the colony. His only daughter married Colonel Robert Bowling. Their son, Major John Bowling, was the father of a number of children. One of the daughters married Colonel Richard Randolph, who was the ancestor of the famous John Randolph of Roanoke, a fact of which he was always proud. Thus the blood of Pocahontas flows today in some of the leading families of the Old Dominion. Now, no one would think that the life of Captain John Smith would be complete without the story of Pocahontas. Its romance lends it a pleasing interest despite the doubt that must always linger as to its truth. But have you ever heard that his life was saved by another Indian maiden, and that a different section of the country produced its Pocahontas to serve her merciful purpose? In the month of March 1905, Robert H. Gardner of Bangor, Maine, in rummaging through some old papers bearing upon the early history of Kennebec River, found proof that in the summer of 1614, Smith sailed up the river to the chief village of the Cabasas tribe of Indians, which stood on the present side of Gardner. The daughter of the chief, Sabuus by name, so liked the manner and looks of Smith that she formed a strong attachment for him. He was so interested with important matters, however, that he gave no encouragement to her. The visit to the chief was very friendly, but when Smith was about to leave, one of his lieutenants, named Hunt, headed a mutiny, and with several others set out on a new expedition, taking several of the Cabasas tribe with him as captives. Not knowing of the division of the party, the chief called his warriors together and started in pursuit of Smith with the resolve to destroy the white men for the outrage of which he believed all were equally guilty. Knowing the danger of Captain Smith and his friends, Sabuus ran ahead and warned him. She overtook the party just as they had encamped for the night a few miles down the river. The chief and his warriors were close behind, and at the moment the Cabasis maiden flung her arms around Captain Smith, a shower of arrows poured into the camp. One of these pierced the girl's breast while shielding the captain, who was thereby saved at the cost of the life of his devoted friend. The horrified chief stopped hostilities. This gave Smith the chance to explain that it was the mutineers who had kidnapped his people. The Indians carried the body of Sabuus back to their village and sorrowfully laid it away near what is now Randolph Churchyard and then started in pursuit of Hunt and his party. They were overtaken and their whole party slain near Norwich Walk, after which the rescued captives returned home with their countrymen. So we're going to go ahead and stop there for this episode. So here we heard kind of what went on after Pocahontas saved John Smith's life. There was some early strife between Powhatan and the settlers. Then there was peace, and then we heard at the end this story about another Indian maiden basically saving John Smith's life again. So if you want to hear more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.